two very important developments on the free speech front get to the heart of the matter, what's the problem, and what can be done about it. Now, Project Veritas has a new expose, and uh, this is awesome. This is two Facebook insiders who have come out and revealed their plan to suppress posts on Facebook, to demote them, reduce their circulation, maybe cut them off altogether, that are critical of um, the vaccine. Now, um, the idea here is to censor not just false posts. Traditionally, these digital platforms say, we're, we're going after misinformation, but no. In this case, they admit the post may be true. Someone could say, I took the vaccine, had a horrible reaction, this is what happened to me. And Facebook's point is, it doesn't matter if it's true, we're going to repress it and censor it anyway. So this is, I think, a, a remarkable escalation and shows that what Facebook is doing here is it's trying to rig the debate. It isn't trying to have it out over facts because they admit you could be making factual statements about the vaccine and yet you will be cut off. Now, this stuff is getting way out of hand. And there are some people, including some people on the conservative and libertarian side who say, well, yeah, but it's uh, it's not a violation of the First Amendment. Facebook is, after all, a private company. Uh, and I want to talk for a moment about the fact that free speech is not confined to the First Amendment. Let's think for a moment about why we need free speech. What is the point of free speech? Well, there's a political point to it. Free speech is necessary to have the arguments that make democracy work. You can't have democracy without people being able to express their views. So there's a political reason for it. There's kind of a philosophical reason for it. If you don't have free speech, you can't have debate. If you don't have debate, you cannot arrive at the elusive quarry of truth. So going back to Socrates and the discussions and arguments that he had on the streets of Athens, there's a philosophical need need for free speech as the mechanism to arrive at truth. But free speech is also personal. We speak because we're able to say what we think. We are able to say what we feel. The, our language is a part of who we are. It helps to define the way we think of ourselves. And of course, free speech is also social. It connects us to each other. Uh, it's a way of having community because you're able to relate through the important mechanism of language. Now, here's my point. Free speech can be just as threatened in the private sphere as it can in the government sphere. Let me give a group of examples that I think illuminates this point. A radical Islamic uh, husband tapes his wife's mouth shut. Now, he's not the government. The First Amendment technically doesn't apply to him, but he's shutting her up all the same. It's a deprivation of her free speech, her ability to speak at all. Or let's say there's a mosque or a synagogue or some kind of institution where let's say women or any other group is not allowed to speak. Their free speech is being cut off. Consider the abusive spouse, uh, male or female, who forbids the other spouse to say anything. I'm talking, you don't get to say a word. That's a repression of free speech. Think of the college professor who says to his students or to his class, I'm not going to allow any debate. What I say goes. I don't even want to take any questions. Just repeat what I say on the test. He's denying his students the right to inquire, to investigate, to raise, to speak. Uh, and yet, he, this could be a private college. This could be a private school. Nevertheless, there is a repression of speech. Think of BLM and some of its rituals where whites are not allowed to speak. What is that doing? It's preventing whites from being able to participate in the discussion. Now, these are all private entities. And so I want to come back to this point about, about free speech being bigger than the First Amendment. The First Amendment protects against a certain kind of denial of free speech, direct denial by the state. But now someone may go, well, wait a minute, doesn't Facebook have free speech? Shouldn't Facebook have the right to say what it wants and that allows, and that even means Facebook being able to repress people's posts? It's after all their platform. Now, there are two kind of problems with this. First of all, Facebook certainly has the right to speak. They can have a point of view, but if they have a point of view, they can't pretend that they're a neutral platform. If they have a point of view, then they're more like a publisher. They're more like the New York Times. They shouldn't get special government protections because, after all, they are publishers and they have a point of view. They have editorial judgments. Of course, they can exercise them, but they also have to be accountable for them. 
The other problem is that Facebook and Twitter and some of these digital platforms are monopolies. And what that means is that they're denying people access to service, which, by the way, you can't even do in the private sphere. Uh, you can't have a restaurant and say, I'm going to deny service to blacks and I'm a private company so I can do whatever I want. You can't be a toll bridge and say to people, hey, listen, you know, I'm not going to let you pass because I just don't like the looks of you. Of course, you know, you have the alternative of swimming across the river. No, it doesn't matter if you have a private toll bridge. If you have a monopoly over that kind of crossing, you have to basically allow everybody to go by who's willing to pay the toll. Now, the problem with these digital platforms is they pretend to be like the phone company. They're just neutral platforms. They're encouraging further discussion and dialogue. But imagine if the phone company were to jump into your conversation and say, wait a minute, uh, you know, you're, you're spreading misinformation about the vaccine to your neighbors. We're going to correct you. We're going to cut off your phone service. This would be outrageous. Nobody would allow that. They'd shut AT&T down overnight if they attempted to do that. Now, the good news is that Governor DeSantis is going out front on this. He's a trailblazer on this, and he just signed an important piece of legislation, which basically says that uh, these digital censors are going to be accountable in the state of Florida. How? Number one, they're not allowed to censor any candidate for public office. They're not allowed to censor anyone who's in public office. But third, and I think most importantly, Florida citizens are going to be able to sue these companies. And if the violations are egregious enough, the Florida state attorney general will sue on their behalf. So the idea here is to put these guys up against the wall to hold them accountable. I'm quite sure this will all end up in court as it should. Uh, but the bottom line of it is DeSantis is saying enough is enough. Now, DeSantis makes a point I want to highlight here, and that is he goes, these companies claim to be correcting misinformation. And he looks at the example of the Wuhan lab. He goes, they censored all kinds of people, took down their posts because they claimed that it was disinformation. It was conspiracy theory to talk about the origin of the virus being in a lab. Now we know that wasn't disinformation. It was merely information. There was an argument going on about where this virus came from, a legitimate argument. And what did the digital platforms do? They shut down that argument. So they're not promoting information. They're suppressing information. They're not promoting debate. They're suppressing debate. It is long overdue that these digital moguls, these digital fascists, I want to call them, be held accountable. There's a long way to go on this. Uh, DeSantis is only taking the first step. But somebody has to take the first step so that the second, third, and fourth step can be taken next.